everybody, and welcome in for another episode of Rethink Reshoring. I'm Keely Nix here with Rosemary Coates, and excited to bring you another episode. Rosemary, it's great to see you because I've been out of the loop for a couple weeks. You've had some really, really great guests on the show, so it's good to be back. Yeah, great to be back with you, Kaylee. So today we're going to kind of take a very high level view of supply chain, right? We're going to talk a little bit about what's changed since the pandemic. And now that we are, I would consider us officially out of true pandemic lifestyle, including over in China, where all zero COVID restrictions have been lessened and things are on a change or on a, on a way to getting back to normal, we're going to go ahead and talk about kind of high level what the supply chain looks like now and how things have changed. So let's just really start there. Obviously, 2020 shutdowns are long in the past. 2021 economic prosperity is long in the past, and we've had about a year of this down cycle. Now that we've gone through all three steps, shutdown, recovery, down cycle, what do you think the biggest changes and long lasting changes have been? Yeah, I I think it's really important to take a look back over the last couple of years and understand what the differences are because they've been enormous. I think, first of all, most importantly is most companies are now rethinking their global supply chains. So uh, because of the pandemic, it was really, truly a wake up call uh, for executives, not the supply chain people per se that are doing the day to day work, but executives who uh, are now attuned to how much risk there is in their supply chain. So uh, a lot of C-level executives are now involved with supply chain, concerned about it, trying to understand the details. Um, and identifying you know, what kind of action they should take now to mitigate the risk that's involved in their supply chains. So that was the, I think that's the most important thing, but it uh, in parallel with new technologies, uh, with global uh, labor rates, with geopolitics, with all these things that are happening at once, bring supply chain to the forefront. So in today's environment, you know, I used to tell people what I did for a living in supply chain and their eyes would sort of glaze over, you know, and they'd like walk away, go talk to somebody more interesting. But these days, supply chain is in the forefront. It's headline news in the Wall Street Journal every day. It is, um, you know, so important and being rethought at an executive level for the first time really ever, I think, um, you know, being, being, having this much focus on supply chain. I know if you're a supply chain manager, if you are a logistics manager within your company, you know, by this point you're grabbing your C-suite execs and you're like, this is why supply chain matters so much. Like you, you said it until you're blue in the face at this point. Right. And as you mentioned, those geopolitical risks, those things that keep popping up and it seems like every single week, something new is going on that brings supply chain to the forefront. What are some of those really specific risks that we're talking about? Of course, we can think about the tensions between the U S government and the Chinese government, the situation that's yeah. going on in the Middle East, the situation down in Panama. And those are three different types, right? You've got government, you've got humanitarian crisis, you've got environmental crisis going on. Talk to me about some of those specific risks and how some people can go about mitigating some of those. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to see that all these kind of things in, in the world affect supply chain in, in a way that we hadn't really thought about before. Uh, so I, let's start with China. So in China, obviously, the geopolitical risks, the trade war that was started under the Trump administration uh, and the high tariff rates that were placed on imports from China continue on to this day. So the Biden administration has continued those tariff rates and uh, the, uh, I think, tension is at an all-time high between the U.S. and China. Now, Biden was just at the APEC meeting in San Francisco. Uh, he met with Xi Jinping. Um, they walked around a, a place nearby called Filoli, which is a, a lovely uh, garden area. And uh, hopefully they are starting to repair that relationship a little bit because it got really dangerous, I think. Uh, and, you know, we, we don't necessarily want to be best buddies with China, but we also don't want to be at war with them. So I think China is probably the, the biggest risk factor that people are now understanding 
of the importance of, uh, of addressing this in, in global supply chains. So first of all, I think companies recognize these long global supply chains, particularly with single source uh, suppliers in China is really, really dangerous. It's time to even that out and have either multiple suppliers or have multiple locations to manufacture. And hopefully that includes more manufacturing coming back to the US. There also were so many production disruptions, you know, when China was closing down their cities, they, they completely shut down the cities. Um, in Wuhan, for example, they shut down the entire metropolitan area and locked people in their apartments. So they, people couldn't even go out to walk around the block. Uh, they were locked in their apartments. The government delivered food to them a couple of times a day. They were stuck in these tiny little apartments all over, all over Wuhan. And then later in China, Shanghai, the same thing happened. And in southern China, uh, Guangdong province, so uh, Guangzhou, Dongguan, Shenzhen, these, these areas were also locked down. And that caused production disruption. So where you thought, you know, you were going to get your production uh, in six weeks or something like that, now all of a sudden it's taking three months to get that same production. And that disrupts your whole supply chain. Those could have been raw materials for production in the U.S., for example. Uh, there were also many logistics disruptions uh, to and from China, as um, probably people recognize. Container rates soared. They were 20 or 30 times what was normal. Now, they're back to sort of normal now, but during that period, a lot of companies went out of business in the U.S., a lot of importers, because they couldn't afford the logistics costs to get the product here from China. And that was another big wake-up call for a lot of companies. Um, rare earth threats are a big one now. Um, so rare earth elements are um, critical metals and, and elements that are found really worldwide, but there are big deposits of them um, in certain places, including China. And China is the by far the biggest refiner of these rare earth elements. Now, the reason why that's important is that the rare earth elements are used in all electronics. So you have to have some of these elements in order to build any kind of electronic equipment, any wiring, all of that. So China controls 85% of that market. And once they cut that off, we are really in deep doo-doo because uh, we don't have a supply of that readily available. So we're rethinking that in the US as well, trying to open new mines and so forth. So those are some of the risks. And then in addition to that, because many companies have reshored or are moving out of China for another alternate location, an awful lot of suppliers are going bankrupt in China. And when they go bankrupt, it's not like the US where there are laws, bankruptcy laws and you have to notify people and so forth. In China, they just simply close the doors and turn off the lights. And uh, you are out of luck. If you have a production run going on and they are bankrupt, you know, your production run is going on today on a, on a Monday and then tomorrow on a Tuesday, uh, they go bankrupt, you're just out of luck. You're not going to get any of that production back. So those are some of the things in China. Now, you also mentioned the Middle East, obviously, with the uh, Israeli-Palestine conflict. Um, that's disrupting all sorts of supply chains uh, in, in uh, Northern Africa and in Western Europe. Um, that hopefully will be resolved or at least calmed down a little bit in the near future. But look at Ukraine. So we've had a, a war with uh, the the war on Ukraine by Russia has been going on now for over a year, a year and a half or so. And uh, that has disrupted supply global supply chains in a big way. Um, Ukraine is uh, producing a lot of the world's uh, wheat uh, and other grains, and all of those supply chains have been disrupted. So there's terrible food shortages around the world as a result. And in, in another thing, they produce a lot of raw materials. For example, neon gas is produced or was produced in Ukraine. And neon gas is used to produce semiconductors. So uh, the Russians bombed the neon gas factories very early on, and there was a shortage of neon gas to be able to produce semiconductors, which resulted in a semiconductor shortage uh, that we saw a few months ago. 
So those are some of the global risks that are going on now that we we did not see prior to the pandemic. So, of course, if you are a company who relies on some of these materials, whether it be those raw earth materials or whether you rely on the production going on in China and rely on the other companies who are using that producer to make sure that your lot stays good, a lot of that is something that you really can't control, right? You can't necessarily control if your producer goes out of business, if you have set up the right structure to do business with them. Can you touch a little bit on what some companies can do then to mitigate that strategy? Obviously, we've talked a lot about reshoring efforts and shortening those supply chains, making them a little bit less complex, bringing them closer to home. So you do have a little more oversight to that. Is that really the only way to get around this is to use reshoring tactics to make sure that your supply chain is close to home and easily manageable? Yeah, I think um, you're absolutely right. And that is uh, basically the the thought pattern. So a lot of companies are rethinking their global supply chains. And that includes bringing production back to the U.S. And so we're, we're rooting for that, obviously. Um, at the Reshoring Institute, that's uh, what we hope primarily happens. But there are a lot of companies that are also nearshoring. So bringing manufacturing to Mexico, for example, uh, which allows you to move things across the border more more efficiently, as well as take advantage of USMCA, which is the trade agreement between the US, Mexico, and Canada uh, that allows you to bring things into the US duty-free. Uh, and Canada duty three. It's a three three country agreement that allows for free exchange of goods if you meet the requirements. So an awful lot of companies are are thinking about reshoring um, and nearshoring, or what we call a China plus one or a China plus two strategy. So China plus one would be uh, keeping some manufacturing in China and then picking an alternate country for more manufacturing, maybe Vietnam or Thailand or Malaysia uh, and or the U.S., hopefully, uh, or China Plus Two, where a lot of companies will say, "Okay, we're going to leave some manufacturing in China to address the Asian market because it's a growth market, essentially, over time, although China isn't doing so well right now. But across Asia, um, we consider those growth markets. So you may want to keep some manufacturing there to address the regional markets and then bring some manufacturing back to the U.S. and Mexico. So that would be a China plus two. So it's really rethinking this strategy. You know, in the past, Kaylee, so many of my clients would say, just get me to China. You know, we know it's cheaper there and my competitors are there and everybody's going to China. So I want to go too. Um, today, it's a much more sophisticated decision uh, in terms of where to manufacture and thinking through all the various alternatives and the variables that go into that decision making process. I want to go ahead and pivot this to pinpoint a little bit about the labor force and the worker itself in this situation, because there's been a lot of changes from the pandemic from both the U.S. labor force and the global workforce, whether that's in wages or in job expectations or in the jobs that are short of workers and what are people are actually willing to do for work these days. And let's start out with global labor rates, because we know that obviously a big big positive of bringing your manufacturing to China, Malaysia, Bangladesh, even Mexico, is that if you're a U.S.-based company, you're saving a lot of money on labor rates. But some of that is changing. And is that for the better or for the worse in the reshoring perspective of things? Well, you know, I look at it as, um, you know, in in business, things change all the time. So, you, you know, it's really not in your best interest to keep everything the status quo. You have to keep looking out there and see what's happening and changing your strategy to meet those kind of changes. In terms of global labor rates, we did a, a study at the Reshoring Institute um, a few months ago, uh, and we it's published and it's on our landing page at reshoringinstitute.org where we compared uh, labor rates around the world. So we took uh, 10 uh, job categories like uh, production supervisor, factory worker, assembly worker, welder, those kind of job categories. And we compared the labor rates in 12 countries. And uh, surprisingly, what we found was that China is no longer a low cost country, can't be considered a low cost country. The labor rates in China are somewhere midpoint between the U.S. and Western Europe 
and really low cost areas now that are Vietnam, Central Mexico, uh, and India. So China's labor rates have gone up significantly, and that's a, a critical factor also in making the decision on, on where to manufacture. If you have a lot of labor content in your product, so um, the example that I like to use is apparel. If you're making apparel or footwear, and there's a lot of labor content in what you're producing, then you need to look for a low-cost labor country, such as India or apparel, a lot of apparels made in Bangladesh and Turkey and um, uh, Central America, really low cost countries, as well as Mexico and India. Um, or if you have a product that doesn't require so much labor, let's say textiles, for example. So if you're making textiles that go into that apparel, textile production is fully automated. So when, when you have a fully automated process, not so much labor involved, then you have more choices of where to go. Um, if, even if the labor costs are higher uh, in certain areas, because of full automation, you have the ability to go to multiple places, including the US. So there's a lot of textile production, for example, in the Carolinas, um, where um, you know the the uh, production facilities, the factories are fully automated. There isn't much labor content, so you have to think about your own product. Um, what you know, where um, you should produce based on how much labor content is there, and, and then considering the low cost labor countries in the world, um, particularly Vietnam, uh, India and central Mexico. So those are the low, lowest cost ones that we found. So right now we're seeing workers really changing what they want out of jobs and changing what they want out of lifestyles. I think that's one of the biggest things that we took away from the pandemic is that the standard nine to five or the standard manufacturing, the standard labor job isn't necessarily something that is attractive to a lot of the younger workforce that's entering the area specifically. And that's causing shortages of labor. It's causing worker shortages here in the United States. And we see that having a kind of slowing effect on the economy. Is that something that is a global trend where a lot of these younger people who are workforce age aren't entering in the way that they typically were. And that's now having to lead to companies having to rethink their production strategy, maybe invest a little bit more in that automation, robotics, AI, and a more skilled technical workforce instead of that standard manual labor force. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. Um, yes, so that you know it's a it's a problem in the U.S. because we have lots of open jobs at the very low end and not enough workers. But you know, in the U.S., we really we really don't want that twenty three cent an hour t shirt production back. Uh, what we want is higher higher skilled, higher paid uh, jobs. So w what you know, really, what we have in the U.S. is a is a education and training problem not necessarily a labor problem. Um, today's unemployment rate is so low that if you really want to get a job, you can probably get a job. It's just that the, a lot of the lower end ones are lower end jobs um, that don't require so many skills are left open because people choose not to work at those jobs. Um, in, in China, they have the same problem. They have all these college grads that now don't want to work in manufacturing. So, um, you know, they have a mismatch of the skills and the labor, and as a result, they're trying to come up the sophistication curve, so they have less of that um, low-level manufacturing going on and more uh, of a, you know, engineered product uh, production line uh, where it requires a higher level of skill. So that's kind of a, a global trend. And, you know, if you look across the world, Countries are at different levels of um, evolution, I guess I would say. Uh, so uh, rural companies dependent on agriculture um, are now moving into uh, low level production kind of capabilities. Companies that were doing or countries that were doing low level production are now moving into a more sophisticated production environment. And a lot of um, uh, former manufacturing companies are moving into more service requirements. So you see this as a trend over time, where as uh, countries become more educated, more sophisticated, more worldly, they move up 
um, the the maturity curve uh, into a different kind of production environment. So that you know that's really um, an important aspect to think about as well. And you know all these things are changing and have rapidly changed since the pandemic. So it uh, behooves you to to think about that and, and to consider it when when you're trying to consider where in the world to manufacture. So touching on that, of course, a lot of that growth and progress comes because of AI and data science. And let's talk about that to kind of round out the episode. I think that that's a really great ending point because it relies a lot on the implementation of that really skilled technical workforce, as we mentioned. You see companies investing in robotic strategies for their manufacturing. You see companies investing in AI for their supply chain analytics and for really kind of the optimization of their supply chains. And I don't think that there's any question that this trend is not going to go away. It's not a trend that's going to be an industry lifestyle change. Can you touch a little bit on that and what that means for the reshoring, nearshoring initiative, and really what we can expect to change global supply chains coming out of that? Yeah, um, that's a that's also a very good point. So all these things are happening since the pandemic. I mean, it's not that they weren't sort of beginning to happen before the pandemic, but the pandemic created such a disruptive environment. And now all of a sudden there's so much emphasis being placed in supply chain. And that includes all kinds of technology. So um, certainly AI and the use of AI in solving problems and um, determining determining um, what kind of decisions should be made based on data, based on trends, based on uh, you know where to go from here uh, sort of environment, and that's the same is true for data science. So, you know, it used to be uh, we in in colleges and universities we taught all about operations management, and then it became global supply chains. So understanding the interconnection of operations around the world, sourcing uh, uh, customers, where where are your markets, um, automation, all these things were part of the decision. Today's environment, you see at the university level, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, the university programs in supply chain include data science as one of the core requirements. So now in today's environment, um, using data analytics tools, so a lot of software tools, for example, to understand trends, to identify what kind of um, decisions should be made to think forward in terms of um, getting a, a parallel strategy together with what's happening in the world, to consider alternatives. These are all things that are um, added to the menu of supply chain that were never before. I mean. When I started out in this business 40 years ago, it was all about putting stuff in boxes and getting the boxes shipped off the dock every day. I mean, that was, that was, I controlled the, or I managed the uh, <laughs> shipping, shipping dock. And uh, that was the thing, you know, was making sure all the shipments got off the dock every day. Today's environment, I would look at it as, um, you know, what are the trends? Where are we trying to support production? How quickly can we get things there? What kind of decisions should be made in the future for determining where suppliers are? And this is a much, much more sophisticated and complicated environment than it's ever been before. And uh, that's not only pretty exciting, but it's also a little scary for people going into this industry that didn't understand how complicated it was. It is today. So Rosemary, we've got about a minute left. As we head into the end of 2023, obviously we have all of those issues that we talked about at the top of the episode, very front of mind. And the pandemic almost seems like it's kind of removed from I guess, memory right now. It feels like we've brushed off of that very, very quickly, especially in the space because we have so many more things to deal with. Are you optimistic going into 2024, cautiously optimistic or a little bit pessimistic on what the future holds and what reshoring will look like coming into the new year? I am very optimistic. What we see is a manufacturing super cycle coming. So even though the pandemic is in the past, it was really an ignition point 
for understanding manufacturing and our, our global operations. Uh, so in what I see coming is this manufacturing super cycle. There's more investment going into manufacturing. The U.S. government through the three big acts that were passed in the last two years, the, the um, Inflation Reduction Act, which has got um, green energy, the um, Infrastructure Act, the Chips and Science Act, these things are infusing billions of dollars into production in the U.S., there's also uh, indicators that there's a, about a 30% increase in industrial real estate, um, in which is uh, manufacturing real estate in the U.S. There's an enormous boom at the border um, with Mexico. So we're seeing a lot of cross-border commerce going on there. Um, we're seeing more domestic sourcing. We are seeing... Um, uh, a downturn and and uh, sourcing and manufacturing in China. So all of these things are fueling the U.S. economy, and I expect that to continue to grow in a very steep curve in 2024. Well, we will be covering it for sure on this show and on the rest of our freight waves ecosystem as well. Rosemary, thank you for joining us today, and thank you guys for sticking with us through this episode of Rethink Reshoring. We'll see you guys next week. Thank mm-hmm. you.